take two. We're going to be in Psalm 35 this morning. Um, as you're turning there, a couple of things. Uh, Steve, thank you so much for mentioning the 101 class coming up on Tuesday. Even if you haven't signed up for it, if you could let us know today um, so we can make sure that we have plenty of materials. Normally we have it on a Sunday during Sunday school, but God has given me a great privilege over about the past year to be able to uh, be in the Sunday school class teaching the youth. And so um, this has allowed us to be able to have an opportunity to be able to meet. For some of you, it's right after work. I'm so glad. We have about 11 that are signed up. Um, and some of you I'm still waiting to hear from. So if you're interested in ARBC, this would be a great time to, to come. Secondly, some of you may have been hearing a little bit about what we're doing with this Next Steps uh, process. Um, what we're doing is it's basically a, a group that has come in free, has come in, but it's been well, I was going to say well worth it. <laughs> if it's free, that doesn't sound good. It has been, it has really, really been a very helpful process for all of us to go through. And what I'm grateful for is the collaborative aspect of it to where we're seeing and leaning into who we already are, but also looking at, okay, God, where are you uh, taking us as a, uh, as a body of believers and uh, the people that have been on these teams have represented you all very, very well. And we're very close to being able to present all of this to you. Well, Lord willing, we're hoping to have that presented to you in August. And that way that can, uh, that can help the rest of our teams be able to make sure that we're all w working together rather than one team doing their thing over here and another, th you know, the silo effect. We don't want silos. We want to make sure that that's, everybody is working and moving in the same direction in the cause of Christ. It's, it's an exciting thing. Believe me, trust me, this is an exciting thing. And we're very thankful for uh, all who have been involved. So I'm going to ask you if you would to stand. It's a 28-verse psalm. I'm not going to read all of this right at the very beginning, but I, I, I want to at least look at verses 7 to 10, which se seem to encapsulate what David is really trying to communicate in, his issue, in the issues he's dealing with here. Uh, psalm 35, starting at verse 7, For without cause they hid their net for me. Without cause they dug a pit for my life. Let destruction come upon him when he does not know it. Let the net that he hid ensnare him. Let him fall into, this, into it, into his destruction. Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord, exulting in his salvation. All my bones shall say, O Lord, who is like you, delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him, the poor and needy from him who robs him. May God add his blessing to his holy and perfect word. You may be seated. So I was reading through this psalm, and uh, I, as I was looking through some commentaries, as you all know, I tend to enjoy the hymns and, and the songs of the faith. And there was a pastor who was serving in Philadelphia for a long time named James Montgomery Boyce. And what he would do is that when he would preach through the Psalms, he would try to find a psalm or find a hymn that would connect to the psalm. And he was able to do that for the majority of them, but there wasn't one to be found for Psalm 35. As you read through Psalm 35, it's just, it, it's interesting to look at it and you, have to, and you have to make sure you're reading it from the right perspective. But the perspective that I think that we can share with David is that there is nothing like serving Jesus. There is nothing like it. And God calls us to do a lot, of, a, a lot of different things in that. Some people are called into the academy. Some people are called into the local church. Some people are called into the arts and the music. There's, there's lots of different ways that we can go. But when he calls us to that, we need to lean into it because we will find that there is nothing in, on earth that is better than serving Jesus. You don't have to have a title to do that. The only title you have to have is Christian, saint. That's what, he's, that's what God has called us to do. But that does not mean that it's always going to be easy. The place where God called David to serve was as king, king and judge over all of his people. And so when we read through this psalm, it's really important for you to understand that we're not, you're, David is not writing this as a private citizen because that would seem like that we are to all of a sudden take certain matters, violent matters, into our own hands. But when we see what God calls political leaders and specifically judges and police officers and military, well, they have a task to protect and defend not only our constitution, but also the people that are underneath and the people who are citizens of our country. That's where a lot of these decisions are being made, at least we hope so. 
And so when you look at this passage of Scripture, David is talking as one who is king over God's people and asking them, asking God, please contend and fight for us. Help us because we are in a position where we cannot fight for ourselves. Now, that's where when we think about ourselves and we have certain things that we're dealing with, we may get to a point where we're like, I don't know what to do. I got a health issue that's going on. I can't do anything about that right now. I got, you know, I, I may have to do something for my job. And boy, I don't know if I can, you know, if I can do that. I mean, I could go through all of these things. We've all come to a point where it's like, I, I don't know how to get past this. I don't know how to get over that obstacle. And yet here is Christ coming along and he is saying, I will contend for you. I will fight for you. And so when we look at this passage, there are aspects of Jesus that we need to recognize. The three aspects is one, as you see up there, we're going to look at right now, is that he is our divine warrior. Whenever you see in the Psalms, arise, O Lord, rouse yourself, O Lord. That is calling on God to be our divine warrior to contend on our behalf. And we'll see passages of Scripture that uh, bolster that. The other part is about how he is our divine advocate, that he, he hears our case and he defends us. But he's also our divine rescuer, where we are in a position to where we cannot rescue ourselves. And in this case, it was physically where David was in, a, in an issue with enemies coming against him and he wasn't sure how he was going to be able to get out of it. But we may not be in that position. But we are all in a position to where we cannot get out of our brokenness and our sin by ourselves. There's no way we can build a ladder big enough to get to heaven. There is no trampoline that will be able to catapult us to heaven as we need. We need someone to come down and take us where we need to be. So we see that the Bible is all connected. There is a connective tissue of how he rescues us and defends us and cares for us. So let's look at this in verses 1 to 10. Um, where we talk about how he is our divine warrior. Well, let, let's take it a bit at a time. Uh, we won't be able to cover every bit of this, but at some point, hopefully we can. But I want you to at least see this. Look at the action that God is taking in verses 1 to 3. Look, look at your scriptures. See the action that God is taking. Contend, O Lord, with those who contend against me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of the shield and buckler and rise for my help. Draw the spear and javelin against my pursuers. Say to my soul, I am your salvation or I am your victory. Right? So we, we sing these songs, victory in Jesus. I, I repented of my sins and won the victory. Not quite. Jesus won the victory. It's in our, on our behalf. But he, we have to make sure that we are seeing that God is our divine warrior. He sees what's happening, and he will fight for you. He will contend for you. We see these other passages of Scripture when David was trying to convince the people of Israel to go out and stand against nine-and-a-half-foot Goliath. And in 1 Samuel 17, verses 46 to 48, This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. Now he's talking to Goliath. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear. For the battle is whose? The battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. Now, you look at when they were fighting against Goliath. He was a warrior. He was undefeated until he went up against the living God. David had five stones, and that was for Goliath and his four brothers. It wasn't in case he missed because he knew God was on his side. And that's, Jesus is our David with this imposing Goliath that stands up against us. Who are we to be able to stand against such a mighty foe as sin and death? But there is one who stood in our place. Jesus Christ stood in our place. Jesus Christ is that greater and better David. But we also see in Romans 12, 19, which is quoted from various passages in the Old Testament, vengeance is whose? 
Well, when we have enemies coming up against us, boy, there's something that riles up in us. We want to go and get after them. We want to plan and we want to plot. That's not what we're all about. Vengeance, Jesus says, is mine. I will repay because Jesus is like this. How many of you, when you have kids, if you have children and someone does something to your kids, I would say that that is the equivalent of doing something to the dad and to the mom. When you mess with God's kids, when you mess with his children, vengeance is mine. I will repay on your behalf. God is not just a king in heaven. He's not just a judge. He's our father, and he takes care of his children, and that's what we say. I was watching a little video online where it was this, this little elephant was, was chasing around all these geese, and then he was getting a little ahead of himself, and his back end went in front of his front end, and he fell. And you know what he did? First thing he did was he ran to mom. You're going to do that. You're going to be doing all sorts of stuff, and you're going to fall and scrape yourself and all that. Where, where do I run to when that happens? You have a father that you can run to. And he will be there. He will never leave you or forsake you. You are not alone in this world. Some of you may feel like you are. You're not. But as you look, David now starts going into what, what these enemies are all about. And you get in here in verses uh, 4, to, uh, 4 to 10, let them pe- be put to shame and dishonored. The first thing you see is they're trying to seek my life. There's an intentionality about it. They want me dead. They want me silent. Let them be turned back and disappointed. Who devise evil against me? Devising evil. There is an intentionality that some have against the things of God. And it doesn't matter how, among us pastors, there's a conversation about, there are times when you just have to be really winsome in order for people to come against you. You know what, though? I think there's a, you have to be nice. You have to be kind. But there's going to be, there's going to come a time when people are just not going to want to hear about the things of God. And and there and doesn't matter how nice you are because you stand for the things of the Lord, they're going to come after you, and they're going to plot and plan and devise evil against you. That's what was happening with David. Let them be like chaff before the wind, with the angel of the Lord driving them away. Let their way be dark and slippery, with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. Now we talked about that uh, not long ago. The angel of the Lord. Who are you? Are you for us or for your enemies? Neither. I'm a commander of the army of the living God. I think this is a. This was a showing of Jesus Christ before he came to Bethlehem. He's the commander of the army of the Lord. Verse 7, it talks about they're pursuing without cause. David didn't do anything to deserve this, but they were pursuing him anyway. They hid, without cause, they hid their net for me. Without cause, they dug their pit. And so what David is saying is, let them be blown away like the chaff. They have no root. Psalm 1 talks about that. Let them be blown away like the chaff. Let them get out of here. Let them go their way. This is an imprecatory psalm where sometimes we pray and we're real spiritual about things. Oh, Lord, one day when you come back, let justice happen. But there's sometimes when things rile up in us where we're like, Lord, could you just handle that a little bit earlier, like now? And we feel that way because we want to see justice done immediately. That's why some of these things that were happening over the last two or three years, um, got to us because we were seeing some serious injustices take place, whether it was racial injustice or injustice for the unborn or injustice toward um, you know, gender stuff. It, there's, there's this understanding that we want to see right done. We want to see right prevail. When all of that happens, you see what happens with David and the joy that comes along. Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord, exulting in his salvation. All my bones, it's not just my heart, we're even down to the bones that hold us up. O Lord, who is like you, delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him, the poor and needy from him who robs him. That's another thing that God does. I was listening to an interview. Some of you may have heard of Rod Dreher. He wrote a book called uh, Live Not By Lies and the Benedict Option. And um, I, I was listening to an interview by him, and he was talking about all the totalitarian eras uh, of, uh, throughout history and, and the similarities of trying to make sure that they are controlling people and tr- controlling thought and controlling language and such. And we're seeing a little bit of that. I think we could be honest and say we're seeing a little bit of that in the United States of America right now. But what he said was is this. I thought it was very interesting. It caught my attention. He said, Christianity, Christianity is different. 
Because what Christianity does, Christianity doesn't just exalt the one who oppresses. Christianity helps the victims and ones who are being oppressed. They have rights and value too. And he said that's what, that's what ends up happening. And Christianity deals with something called original sin. Is that we are born sinners wanting to go away from God. And he said what's really interesting that Christianity presents that others don't. Is that the moment someone goes from being oppressed to being an oppressor can happen just like that. There was actually a freed slave in South Carolina that was given money and was really good at working on a farm. And it was his farm. He bought his own freedom. And then as as it started getting bigger, you know what he did? He bought some slaves. He had just been rescued from slavery. And then he turned right around and enslaved those who were of his own people. You can go from oppressed to oppressor just like that. And that's why we need God to come in and to change our hearts and to change our minds. It's a character issue, which gets us to this next point, that our divine advocate hears our case. Malicious witnesses, verse 11, rise up. They ask me of things I do not know. They repay me evil for good. My soul is bereft, bereavement, grief. How could they do this to me? We've been there like that. How can people act like this? How can people talk to me like this? How can think I haven't done anything to deserve this? And we can never say that to God. But sometimes we can say that to other people because we're sinners before a holy God. But when it's talking about other people, we're like, I don't know what happened. How did this, this come about? And that's where he is now, God has gone from divine warrior to now basically like a lawyer, a litigator. Hear my case, Lord. See what I've been all about. And he talks about his character. And this can only happen when God changes your heart. Because when people sometimes come against you, there's aspects of it where it's like, I want to get back at you feel that? Someone drives, drives down the road and they say, we're number one. They use the wrong digit. And, uh, we're number one. And sometimes you want to say, no, I'm number one. No, I don't want to. But it's like, you come to this point where it's like, what are you doing? Why are you behaving like this? What have I done to you? Okay, you get the picture. So, Look at verses 13 and 14 and see how God reacts. Oh, and by the way, I love it when I say, look at verses 13 and 14, heads go down. Oh, hearts full. We're talking Grinch's stole Christmas, heart being full. You know what I mean. Verses 13 and 14, but I, when they were sick, I wore sackcloth. I afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed with head bowed on my chest. I went about as though I grieved for my friend and my brother, or my brother. As one who laments his mother, I bowed down in mourning. We need to pump the brakes here and see what is happening here. The enemies, remember who the enemies were. They sought after his life. They devised evil against him. They were doing all of this without cause. They were oppressing, oppressing, the strong oppressing the weak. All of this was happening to David. And how does David respond? I prayed for them. I was brokenhearted when I heard they were sick. I prayed with my head bowed on my chest. He was low, humbled. I grieved as for my friend. Okay, we get that. My brother, well, you get that. Now you're saying you're going to grieve as if it was for your own mom? Do you see what's happening here? David saw them as God sees them. When you get angry and someone gets angry at you, do you see them through your eyes or do you see them with how God sees them? It says that David was a man after his own heart. And I think we can read about David's life and know that he did not get it right all the time. In fact, the moment that he didn't get it right, it did not go well for him for the rest of his life. He did not have one day of peace from all of his enemies. But there was a time where he did. And even when he wasn't getting it right, he was still seeking after the Lord, even in his humbling. He was still seeking after the Lord. But this is what a heart change is. When Jesus apprehends your heart, dear Christian, you start looking at people the way he looks at them. Are you there? Because if you're not, one, yes, it's understandable. That's not giving you an out. 
it's understandable because we may have grown up in a position where people weren't looking at us the way God looks at us. People were looking at us the way they were looking at us. And it was always through their own selfish lenses. And, you know, and we've got to be careful not to inherit that and look at other people based upon, this is how I think you should be and this is what I think you should do. No. We say, Lord, give me eyes to see those who are different from me. Give me eyes to love them, but love them in the truth. Right? So if you have enemies and you have a relationship with them, you don't just love them and say, well, if that's what you want to do, then go be happy. No, no, that's the worst thing. You are sending them down a path of destruction. But what you do is you love them enough to say, this is what God has revealed in his word, and this is what God has done in my life, and I love you enough to tell you what he's done and who he is. And he is on the march And he's an unchanging God that is changing lives every single day. And he can change yours. When we look at what what the scriptures say about our enemies, you know, sometimes we think, ah, Jesus, that's pie in the sky stuff. We live in the real world. Do you know who you're talking to? He's the creator of the world that got broken by our sorry shenanigans, right? But you see what Matthew says in, in Matthew 5, Jesus is preaching, greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher that ever preached. He said this, you have heard that it was said. Did I say where we were? Matthew 5, 43. I could make you guess, but it's a lot of Bible to guess from. But Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's not in the Bible. That was what was passed along. But I say to you, love your enemies and... Pray for those who persecute you. Not just disagree with you, they want you gone. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers... What more, do you, are, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, verse 48 may have lost all of you, but you're saying, I can't be perfect. I'm a sinner. But that's the point. It's the pursuit. Vince Lombardi, when he was coaching the Green Bay Packers, he would say, when, when one of his first meetings with the Green Bay Packers, they were terrible. They had 11 Hall of Famers, but they were a terrible 1-10 in 10 team. And he goes into that, in that first meeting. He said, we are going to chase perfection. And then he says, but I know we're not going to be able to get it, but in the pursuit of perfection, we're going to catch excellence. And Bart Starr said he, he was almost sitting down without even a chair. He's like, whoa. And that's what happens is, no, you're, you're striving for holiness. One day you will be holy in heaven, but you're striving for holiness. You don't give up. You don't, you don't bow to the patron saint of mediocrities. You go and you pursue holiness. And that's what he's called us to do. And as we get back to, uh, to Psalm 35, um, you know, 15 and 16 just talks about, yeah, I'm praying for them, but they're still loving the fact that I'm stumbling and falling and hurting. And then verse 17, (laughs) how many of you could say this question? Oh, Lord, how long? There's an honesty to the Bible. The Bible is not a pie in sky filled with platitudes. The Bible is honest. And in fact, in Revelation 9, when the fifth seal was opened, the fifth seal of the judgment, it said that they opened up and they saw, saw under the altar in heaven all of the martyrs who had lost their lives for the faith. How long was what they were saying? That is a question that was even asked in heaven. Oh, Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Verse 11 And then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of the fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were were to be killed as they themselves had been. You say how long. What the residue that may be surrounding that how long is this. God, have you forgotten me? Because this is going on an awfully long time. 
I want to remind you, and some of you can testify to this, God does not forget his children. He does not forget his children. When he died upon the cross, he was not dying for his own, he was dying for you. He does not forget his children. He has you in mind. He did not look at you and say, well, did you deserve for me to die on the cross? Not one of us would be able to say, yeah, yeah, I'm in. 